Your story is waiting for you today. Your story has something new to say. But your story will only come out to play when you're alone. Alone. Alone in a room with invisible people. The following episode may contain swearing. Alone in a Room with Invisible People is brought to you by hollyswritingclasses.com. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, the host of Alone in a Room with Invisible People. I am here with author and teacher Holly Lyle, and today's topic is show, don't tell. <laughs> so that that is in writing, so why don't you go ahead and define what show, don't tell means. For- okay, this, this is the thing, the, the advice that professional writers give to newbies. Which is, okay, you better make sure that you show, don't tell. But they don't show, don't tell when giving that advice. Yes. So we are going to dissect that today. We are going to show you what showing is, and we are going to show you what telling is. And uh, uh, this is going to be kind of a little semi-workshop kind of thing here. And uh, I'm going to be doing a little description. We've got a couple of things where we will be describing, and then we've got a couple of things where we will be showing. And we are both going to be doing this. And Becky didn't know that we were both going to be doing this. But no, we I actually did not. <laughs> she so. just found that out this second. Well, now I have a pen and a notebook over here, so at least <laughs> that that's good. Yeah, and Shit. I have a little piece of paper over here. But I'm going to basically do these off the top of my head. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe. So, and you can Ooh. probably do that too. You have been doing this long enough to know how this works. Well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we shall so, see. Yeah. Uh, so what we are going to do is we are going to start by telling. Okay. And, and the concept here is that you want the reader to live in your world. You want to bring the reader in and make what's happening so compelling that the person who is reading your words is living in the words is it's real for him or her right then and and they can feel what you you are feeling they can smell what you're smelling they can taste what you're tasting it, it's all just it grabs them and holds them and keeps them immer- immersed and you cannot do this with description so the first thing i'm going to do here and you just kind of get your thing in your head. The first thing okay. I'm going to do is describe a desk. Okay, I am going to, this is description. This is what, there are times and places for description. But um, they tend not to be in fiction. <laughs> okay, so um, the desk is brown. It's large. It has six drawers, uh, three on the left and three on the right. It has a keyboard holder that slides out and slides back in. It is covered with papers. It is messy beyond belief. And the computer that is sitting on top of it is pushed towards the back, but not all the way to the back because it is a fairly large and heavy desk. And the drawers that are in it are full of art supplies because the person who owns it has no reason to own art supplies but likes to buy them. (laughs) That's my desk, okay? That's a description, okay? Describe a desk. Oh, I have to describe a desk? Yeah. Oh, I had something else in mind. Okay. Uh, the, <laughs> there is well, a What desk. did you have in mind? It sits... No, shut up. Okay. I'm, I'm working now. <laughs> <laughs> there is a desk. It sits on a fake carpet. It is white on the top with lots of stains, many different colors. It is rimmed in wire. <laughs> It has black metal. It has two open drawers. It holds duct tape. <laughs> it has candles for some reason. Um, I'm, I'm peeking because I don't know what the hell's in it. <laughs> it has paintbrushes on top because this person does have a reason to own art supplies. <laughs> it has a art lamp, several books, a cat currently who is being annoying, uh, some yarn, some trash, some paper, some polymer clay, a bottle of water, and, and, and like a, a paint water jug with two sections. There's actually a lot more on this desk. It's horrible, but I'm, I'm going to stop there. Oh, it has a microphone on it, too. Yeah. I am describing my desk right now. There you go. Yes. Yes, mine is down the hall in the office, so. 
<laughs> I, I had to do it from memory. Okay, that's a description. There is nothing in that that pulls you into a story. Um, I'm going to now describe a man. Uh, the man is <clears throat> five ten, five eleven, weighs a hundred and eighty pounds, muscly, uh, shaved head, blue, very blue I know eyes. It. Yeah, uh, very, very steely blue eyes. Um, goatee, a little, little clipped tight goatee and mustache going a little gray now. <clears throat> uh, can do uh, 100 push-ups at a pop. The good ones, the, the, the military-style push-ups. Um, and that's Matt. Okay? Go ahead. This is going to be interesting. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do Tony. Yeah. So let's see. Okay. This man is... About six feet tall, shaved head, goatee, <laughs> short, clipped, going a little gray. <laughs> um, and no, he does not look anything like Matt. No. This, this is why I actually picked Tony because I had somebody else in mind, but I wanted to point this out because they don't look anything alike, but just based on that description, yeah. Um, about 180, maybe 190 pounds. I, I, I don't know. Maybe he's he has gained a little weight, so maybe he, he he's got a, a belly he makes fun of now. Uh, <laughs> but wait, wait, I shouldn't, I shouldn't. Yeah, I'll, I'll include that. He has brown eyes. He has piercings. Um. He wears Buffalo Bill shirts and jeans, and wears pajamas most days. <laughs> he has okay. big feet. <laughs> big feet. Yes, yes. So does Matt. Size size. 13 or 14 shoes. Oh, good Lord. Tony does not have quite that big feet. <laughs> so there we go. Um, and again, there is nothing in this to bring you into a story. Okay. Now we're going to describe, uh, well, I'm going to describe a car accident. You can go with something different for this. Okay. Um, there are two cars. Uh, both of them have crumpled hoods. There are pieces of car all over the road. Uh, little bits and pieces of glass. Um, the doors are open. There is a person hanging out of the driver's side uh, on one, on in one car and the other car. Uh, there is a person slumped over the steering wheel. Okay, that's my description. Okay, mine is going to be a house on fire. Okay, because I've seen that. <laughs> All right. Um, smoke, lots of smoke orange and red flames out the windows and door there are several men with a hose outside they're putting water on the house and um five or six people are standing in front of the house watching as the um lots and lots of parts of the house have already turned black and the windows are busted out. Right. There you go. Okay. <clears throat> now, that is a description. That is telling somebody. And as you can see, there is not a lot of, uh, of story. Intrigue. There's no emotion. Right. There's yeah. no emotion. There's no intrigue. There's no, there's no living inside the story. Okay? So the question you then ask is, okay, this is the thing that I know has to be in the story. I need to have a car accident. I need to have a man. I need to have a desk. I need to have something in the story, and it's important. Okay, so why does this thing that you started to describe matter to your story? Um, so let's show the desk in use, okay? And this desk has a, a critical secret that is part of the story, okay? And... Uh, we're going to do that. And, and again, I don't have any of this shit written down. I am just going to do this live. Um, uh, let's see. Bob sat at the desk typing wildly, madly, furiously, knowing that everything in his life was falling down the hole and that this letter, this one letter to this one person might be able to save him, might be able to give him back his life. He's being blackmailed, and he doesn't understand who knew the truth and why. And, and then something clicks in the back of his head that 
his phone is on this disk and his 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 world is attached to this desk and everything that he loves comes at one point or another through this desk through his internet through his telephone and then he realizes that he had conversations while sitting at this desk and he leans over and looks under under the sliding door and that's when he sees the bug and that's it. That his desk has been bugged. That he is yeah. okay. But and, and I mean, this is not. This is showing. This is not telling you that this is what the desk looks like. This is showing you what how the desk is being used, yeah. and why it matters to the story. Because if it's so many things get put into the background of stories and thrown in there. And then they aren't ever used. They don't. They're not there for a reason. This desk is there for a reason. This desk is, has been spying on this character. Yeah. Okay. So your turn. Okay. Uh, and even though I don't, I, I get irritated by the Kate and Bob thing. I don't know why. It's <laughs> not at you, but it's just like everything. It's just the the names get boring. I'll use Kate. Okay. Um, <laughs> Kate had been dreaming about this moment all day, all week. She dreams about this moment every day, every week. She sits down at her desk and she pulls out the canvas. She started, and you can see from having started, the mess on the desk. <laughs> Didn't mean <laughs> for that to kind of rhyme. Um, <laughs> the paint splotches are everywhere. She doesn't care. The rest of her home's immaculate, but her desk, her desk is is her creative space. She pulls out a paintbrush. She, she pours the paint in tiny globs on a glass palette. And she gets to work. The time flies. She reaches down under the desk into one of the metal drawers for the cleaner. She brushes, she, she cleans her brushes in the, I don't know what it's called, <laughs> multi-purpose plastic brush washer. <laughs> don't don't use that name. I'm just this is all off the top of my head, and I'm still sleepy. Um, she uses both the barrels to get the brush clean, and she goes in for new paint. She loves new paint. She's creating a portrait. She doesn't know who they are or why they're important, but they're important to somebody else, and she loves this work. And the desk. Is her creative safe space? There you go. I don't know. I don't yes. know. There we no, go. No, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. That, that that's good because it the desk is then in the scene for a purpose. And it, I got some description in there, some of what is yeah. in or around it. And again, I wouldn't have actually written it that way. And I think the same thing with Bob and the bug oh, and God, everything. Yeah, but no, the point is, you know, just when to you're show writing it, things, come together much more <laughs> cohesively. Cohesively, yes, <laughs> yes. When you are doing this spontaneously off the top of your head. But this is just, this is demo. This is showing, okay? Yeah. Um, we so, can do the man yeah. and then the car accident, too. Yeah. I like this. This yeah. is fun. Okay. So, um, running. And just to, as a warning, this is the, the, the man descriptions are probably going to be gushy and disgusting and romantic <laughs> and cloying. And, you know. No, no, no. This is, I'm, I might not even be describing, I might not even be using the same man. I just, oh, okay. I have man here, okay? Um, running, breathing hard, panting, chased by something big, something dark, something in the shadows that has been sliding behind him. And, and he is in the alley, caught, trapped. He doesn't know how to get out. He doesn't know where to go. But, but one thing he knows is true. The stick that he sees in the corner, the, the metal pole that he sti- sees in the corner can save him from this, this shadow, this click, this growl that is moving towards him. He races, grabs it, lifts it, holds it, and the werewolf slides out of the corner of the alley and leaps into the air, and the man spears it through the throat with the metal rod. Okay, the only thing you know about the guy there, you have no idea what he looks like. Okay, what he looks like doesn't matter. 
What matters is that he's breathing hard. He's scared. He's got something coming after him. He's looking for a way to save his life. He knows he's in trouble. He's trapped in an alley that apparently has a dead end. And he sees in the alley one thing that he can use and uses it and saves his own ass (laughs) in the last (laughs) moment. Or maybe, you know, I didn't go to the next scene. The werewolf might pull the thing out and uh, turn into a guy and come after him again. But, but... The, the description just shows you what the man looks like. The action shows you who the man is. Okay, your turn, man. Yeah, I, it's funny because mine starts off a little bit like yours. Um, <laughs> the sound sent him running, jolting out of bed naked, shoving on clothes next to just the clothes that were on his bedstand. Grabs radio keys in the car. Speeding, slamming on the brakes at the at a building, opening the the garage door, jumping in the truck and awaiting for a secondary person. Driving again, speeding, lights flashing, siren wailing. In pajamas, he jumps out, throwing on his jumpsuit. Fire thing. <laughs> jump suit fire My thing. husband has been a firefighter for eight years now. Yes. And I still don't know what the fuck that shit's called. Gear, I it's, think. Yeah, yeah, gear. There we go. He throws on his gear. <laughs> Boots already attached. He's panting because he's a little out of shape and he's not happy about it. <laughs> he grabs a hose, pulls it back, and the fire, or in the water, bursts out of the hose. A fire, that would have been bad. That would have like been Fahrenheit 451 firefighters. <laughs> yes. Um, his Buffalo Bill, his 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 Buffalo Bill shirt, old, ragged with time, holes all over the place, helps very little against the cutting cold of the winter. <laughs> but he's determined to put out this fire. There you go. <laughs> and again, you didn't you did not describe the guy. You described the action. Or you well, didn't describe the action, little, you showed the action. Right? Yeah, I showed the action. He's a little out of shape. I put that in there because Tony complains about that. And uh, <laughs> I made sure to put the Buffalo Bill shirt in there. I, I think that it shows a certain amount of personality. The fact that his pajamas have holes in him and he doesn't care. The fact that he's a football, he obviously likes football. You know, mm-hmm. that, that just little things like that right. can show those things without you telling somebody, hey, uh, he like, he is a football fan. And, right. And um, he is... Uh, not a I don't remember what they call them but they're uh the men that that are very worried about the way they look mm-hmm. um there's a there's a term for it. I'm so out of date I don't give a shit um, about stuff narcissistic like that, but... no, <laughs> no I don't think so w- women women can care about what how they look I think men should be able to care about it too okay but all right men maybe they're they're kind of like a male fashionista he's obviously not one of those and right. he's a volunteer firefighter he's he's down to earth he you know he's just a dude so yes. I I think that those little descriptions in there described during the action help show right. those help to flesh him out but they are yeah. not telling the character they're not telling the reader who he is they are showing by him by by just having him in what he wears and in showing him doing what he does yeah Um, so it doesn't say this man is a firefighter he likes football and he doesn't care about the quality of his pajama clothes right you know it's it's like it just shows you that shit right right exactly okay and then the third one here is we are going to show the car accident happening Okay, and um, she wasn't paying attention. She was, everything had gone wrong in her life. And the the little Ford Escort was new, the first new car she'd owned in 15 years. She wasn't familiar with the brakes. It was, she had less than a thousand miles on the car. And she had her previous car had had power brakes and the car and the truck in front of her skidded to a a halt and she was following too closely and hit what she thought were power brakes and they didn't stop the car there was a crunch a horrible crunch 
and the front end of her brand new car curled up in front of her and stopped before the windshield. And she sat shaking, trembling, horrified at the suddenness of something she had not been ready for. And that, that, that is me pulling out, uh, having wrecked the, the, the escort. The escort? Yep. 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 <laughs> yep. 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 That's, that, was, that was after everything had gone wrong. <laughs> and then, then that went wrong, too. So. <laughs> oh. Okay, so mine is the firefighting scene thing. Okay. He'd only wanted to cook Mommy breakfast. She'd been tired. She worked so hard. And he'd seen her do it before. He'd helped her with breakfast. So he knew he needed a match, and he needed to use it with the stove. He remembered the knobs. So he turned on the stove. But he couldn't find the matches. So he went around the house looking, searching. Where did Mommy put the matches? Then he remembered. She smoked. So he went to her purse. And he grabbed the lighter. On his way back to the kitchen, he kept trying, flicking, flicking. He couldn't seem to get it to work. Flicking, flicking. And he lit it. He didn't remember anything until he woke up outside the house. Next to his mom, his dad, and his two older sisters. Huddled together in front of the house. The ambulance he could hear from a distance. And he watched his firefighters stood in front of them and tried to put out a giant fire. The house was not the same anymore. Wow. That works. <laughs> that works. You, you, you had me with a little kid and a lighter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and the gas, too, and he couldn't oh, find the matches. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. I was like, oh. Yeah, because then you see the house filling with gas, and you think, oh, fuck, yeah. this is going to be Luckily, burned. it wasn't long enough to actually kill anybody. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, because I was know. anticipating, you know, knowing knowing me. The little kid died. Yeah. yeah knowing you. Yeah, yeah, because uh, I, t- my stuff goes dark. Damn. But it was, it was enough to at least blow him back and, and knock him out against the wall, I guess. Yes, yes, and this, this is showing. And, and, you know, these are not in the language of fiction these are Mm -mm. us pulling stuff off the top of our heads live and not having had anything prepped beforehand and just so this is not beautiful prose so so in other words don't you judge us (laughs) (laughs) you buy our books and read our words and then you judge us yes yes there you go because this is not how we write but this is how you think this is how you put yourself into the scene and you say, okay, what do I smell? What do I do? All your senses, okay? Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And then how does it smell? How does it taste? How does it sound? How does it feel? What does it, what, what, what is the effect that it has on you as you step into it and you give that to a character? Yeah, and if you can't smell, if you have chronic anosmia, ask people what stuff smells like. So mm-hmm. I know that I he probably should have said something about, that's funny, I smell something like bad eggs, and then lit the lighter and it worked. And, and then because <laughs> that gives the reader that instant second of foreshadowing, oh shit, the house is going to go, you know, everybody's mm-hmm. going to die. Um, which would be a neat little detail in there because all of the the different senses are so important. So if you, like me, can't smell for whatever reason, you know, just ask somebody because uh, uh, my husband has finally caught on that this is a necessity for me and I need him to tell me what shit smells like. Because <laughs> you have never smelled it. Nope. Yes. Nope. Yes. But yeah. So that's, it's just, it's it's not perfect, but it's a good example of of the, sh- the, the telling first and then the showing because we took the same scenes. Mm-hmm. But all of those details did not get included. I, I could have easily said something like he wondered why the house was black now or he wondered where the roof had gone something or or why were all the windows jagged and broken you know some some Mm -hmm. little detail like that can definitely help right right and and this is this is the difference between show and tell um and you you go back to why does this matter to the story when you have the reason um for example there, there's a car accident, but why does it matter? 
Mm -hmm. Um, Is it because somebody important dies? Is it because um, this is how your two romantic characters meet each other? That she rear ends him and it turns and he's all angry and then he meets her and and they fall in love. Um, Or is it just another way to show how everything in her life is going wrong? Exactly. Or there is just, there is a reason for putting this in the story. And if there isn't, don't put it in the story. You know, if the, if you are describing a desk and the desk has absolutely nothing to do with the story, don't describe the desk because you are promising to the reader. And the more you describe something, the more you are promising to the reader that this is going to be something really important later. Um, In one of my paranormal romance novels, uh, I showed a, a, doctor's uh, lounge, not a lounge, but their overnight room uh, for when they have to stay in the hospital and they're trying to catch a few hours of sleep and they're working the ER. They have this little room and it has a desk in it and it has a bed in it and it's pretty much, it's just stark. It's sad and stark. But I went ahead and described it because I knew that the doctor and uh, one of the characters, the other main character, were going to have sex on that desk later. (laughs) So (laughs) that was why that was in there. Didn't use the yeah. bed, used the desk. And sometimes description can give a feel of the place. Yeah. Can give, like, because you want to show what kind of hospital. So mm-hmm. if it's, you know, if it's a, a really pimp, expensive teaching hospital or, or you know, like Shans in Tallahassee, it's going to come across better than, let's say, you know, the um, smaller, less funded hospital in Lakeland, Georgia. Right. You know, it's it doesn't even do everything in their tiny little rooms and stuff so that that can help give the person a sense of the story but or the place right and the setting and that matters too right exactly it's it it is a case of all right there's the room is empty sunlight the morning sunlight is creeping through the blinds and the the light is so high that it hits the the top corner of the of the room and it's silent and there's dust motes floating through the sky and it's floating through the air in the room and all of a sudden you can see a little drop of red on the ceiling it wasn't there before but now it is and then the red becomes brighter and darker and it starts sliding down the wall. Okay, so that's showing. And what does that show? That there's a dead guy upstairs on the floor, and the blood has puddled and leaked through the ceiling, and now it's starting to run down the wall. Okay? But that's showing. That's not saying, hey, there's a dead guy in the attic. (laughs) That's saying there's light, there are dust motes, it's calm, it's peaceful. The sun is, is, is rising, but as the sun moves up and the beam moves down, a little trickle of red slides down the white wall. Yeah. Okay? And that moves your character into the story. Or that moves your reader into the story. Yeah. Um, so why does this matter to the story? Telling is passive. It's sitting and watching things happen to other people. Showing is active. It puts the reader right inside the story. It lets the reader be the character and survive the experience. It makes it, and, and when you're writing, it allows you to do this too. Yeah. If you, yeah, that's one of the cool things that I loved doing was um, <sighs> describing different things in Leaving Wanda Lucia, but trying to keep it small, trying to keep it important, and, and showing the character of, of the people. So there's there's this house that's a antebellum house and it's I tried to keep the description very small, but I wanted to show the importance of the age and the character of um somebody who's not even a POV character, but the the personality of her, how she has doggedly, you know, she she bought the house, she 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 spent years and years putting it back into a better shape without destroying its history, you know, and, and just these little things just by describing that home as the character and the, the, the two main characters drive up to it, 
you get a sense of the place that she lives in. You get a small sense of, of how the main character grew up and his mother's priorities and, and the things that matter to her. Mm -hmm. it's, it was you, the way you did this. It was how things worked how the people interacted with each other in this place. Yeah. Um, there there it, was... It gave you a sense of the Deep South, too. Right, right. That, that's kind of like... It, it, there are multiple reasons to have description that helps. Right. It helps it matter. Right. And so, it brings your, your person into that world. Yeah. Exactly. The, the thing to focus on is why is this thing in the scene? Yeah. Because if it... It's... So you're going to... You are going to show instead of telling by asking, what do I want to happen in this scene? And the, that's focusing on the action. <laughs> there's there's <Sorry>. a cat. <laughs> there is yes. a cat right in front of me. <laughs> well, in, in front of me blocking your view you, of me. Yes, in front of you blocking me from seeing you. Writers with cats. Yes, there we are. It's a, they're, they're a requisite. They're, they're the ones who improve the manuscript by sitting on it. If you're... Yes. If you're Yes. And yeah. Batman approves it by eating it. <laughs> yes. Spencer used to do that. <laughs> you have little tooth marks on the manuscript. Yep. yep. Paper eaters. Yep. Okay. So then after you have asked, what do I want to happen in this scene? You ask, to whom does it matter? Uh, because there is going to be either a character who's present or a character who's absent um, for whom what the action that you are showing is going to affect that character. Uh, so if you, okay, you have the blood running down the wall, uh, that's going to matter to the person who comes home mm -hmm. and, and finds a corpse in the attic because blood running down the wall and who is incapable of, of explaining to the police how that corpse got there. It's funny because when you said the room was empty, I was like, okay, so house. And then you said the dead body. So I was thinking that, Ooh, a real estate agent is going to come in and... <laughs> You discover it and it's just it's it's amazing how many different ways you can take a story right right um and then you ask what will this change um yeah the the mention of not power brakes was the cause of the accident that that i was used to stopping the car with brakes that when you touched them lightly they stopped and I was very new to the car, less than a thousand miles on the thing, and most of those I hadn't put on it uh, because you know you'd have to you know, test drive the test thing. Test drive, yeah. And yeah. other people have test drived it, drove it. Yeah, my <laughs> little Cobalt had about three hundred miles when when I got it. Yeah, exactly. So so you 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 tap the brake instead of slamming the brake, and instead of the brake working, you go <laughs> into the rear end of somebody's truck and it's a brand new car. <laughs> And then, okay, so who, to whom does this matter? And then you put the character to whom it matters in the middle of the change. You, you make this change, you have the character right there, and while you're writing, you be the character. And you, you put yourself in that person's skin, and you feel what they feel, you hear what they hear, you see what they see, you smell what they smell, you taste what they taste. You, you get the pain, you get the cold, you get the heat, you get whatever it is that that, that character is experiencing. And you put that on the page as, as inside the character as you can be. Because that is what allows your reader then to go in and be this person the character the, the 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 reader has never been. That when you are when you have somebody who's jumping out of an airplane and waiting until they're very, you know pretty close to the ground before they pull the ripcord and and you know the chute opens, you want to hand them the keys to being that person. You want them to feel the air against their skin. You want them to hear the sounds that you hear when you are falling out of the sky. You want them to see the ground moving closer. You want them to, to know the kind of gut tension of, of, oh my God, I've done this, I'm committed, and there is a percentage chance that the chute is not going to open. And this is, I'm doing this on purpose. 
What, what, what is wrong with my brain? And you want, you want the character to do this. You want the, or do you want the reader to do this? And you want them to do it through being the character that you put them inside of. And that is showing versus telling. So what's the takeaway? Basically just kind of wrap it up for everybody if there's, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the takeaway is the questions. It is what do I want to have happen in this scene? Um, ask to whom does it matter? Ask what will it change? Ask, put the, oh, put the character to whom it matters in the middle of the change and while you're writing, be the character that, and, and bring every sense that that character has into the scene. And it, it, when, when you do that, then you will be showing rather than telling. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. So uh, we hope this episode has helped. If you have any questions, if you have any, um, you know, comments or anything that you feel that we could kind of go into further detail, uh, the best place to do that is on the forums. It's hollyswritingclasses.com. Create a free account. Join the forums. It's clearly marked podcast. I think it's our podcast, Alone in a Room with Invisible People. And we've got a lot of people in there that, you know, will will also join in the conversation if you have any questions or anything like that. So yeah, that has been our episode on Show Don't Tell. If you have any other ideas for episodes of, of this nature, which is kind of like, okay, well, I don't understand um, this or, or, you know, I don't get passive versus um, active or just anything writerly that is specifically about certain techniques or skills, let us know. We we do have a lot of different podcast ideas, topics and stuff, but we are always willing to listen to um, our listeners and figure out what it is that you really need to hear about. And we can we can do minis. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's it. You can follow us on the show, the socials. We're not terribly active, but we, you know, do post stuff. And that's, uh, you can follow Holly at Holly Lyle. And that's on Twitter. Uh, she has created an Instagram, which is just personal, but yeah. <laughs> it's at holly.lyle. She doesn't post very much, but it is there. You can follow, um, oh, yeah, you can follow me. I'm at Rebecca Gallardo. That's um, on Instagram. Uh, yeah, so anyway, that's just us. You can follow us at A-I-A-R-W-I-P. And that is on Twitter and Instagram. You can also search the hashtag alone with invisible people or alone in a room with invisible people. We are on Facebook alone in a room with invisible people. You can look us up on our website and see all of our different um, episodes at alone with invisible people.com. And Holly's writing classes. Like I said, we have our forums in there and they are free. Um, you can uh, if you would like to support the podcast, you can join our Patreon. Just look for Alone in a Room with Invisible People or AIARWIP. And we have three different tiers. Currently, there's no rewards, but we are working on that for 2019. We, If you also would like to support us, but maybe just on a one time or, or when you can spare a couple extra bucks basis, you just go to alonewithinvisiblepeople.com and there is a drop down menu on the top right that gives you three different options. We are still doing the books for reviews, but it is going to end in January of 2019. So if you have not left us a review and you want to leave us a review and get two, you know, free thank you presents for leaving us that review, leave the review, email us at show at alonewithinvisiblepeople.com and let us know that you left the review. We'll verify it and then we will send you Squick Studies, which is Holly's short story based in Settled Space. We will send you Good Bones, which is my paranormal story and uh, it's also short. I'm trying to think of anything else. I just want to say thank you to all of our listeners. Thank you very much. You know, share, rate, subscribe places <laughs> if you want to subscribe to us on anywhere itunes Castbox, uh spotify stitcher you know the subscriptions they, they kind of help Podbean. a little bit yeah Podbean, Podbean, which is our host <laughs> um you know just really we we appreciate all of the support from you guys if, you know your constant interaction is 
really, really awesome. We still have our 10 minute timer challenge, which is running for 30 days. And I am going to do this every month. We are doing that in the forums and it is listed as the 30 day 10 minute timer challenge. So if you want to write to a timer, if you want to get more out of the time that you are spending writing, give this challenge a shot and keep up with everybody else in there and, and keep yourself accountable. So I guess that's it. Um, again, just, you know, it's the holiday season. So happy holidays, stay safe. And thank uh, you. For, and thank you so much for listening. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, you guys are awesome. <laughs> and, and, and we are so grateful that you show up and, and let us talk about stuff we love to talk about and give us an excuse to do it every week. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of hard work, but it's a lot of fun. It's what we love doing and talking about it is is fun yeah and now a word from our sponsor you want to write you love words you love fiction but you don't know where to start or how to middle or where to finish i do i'm holly lyle and i've been doing this professionally since 1991 and i know how i did what i did to go pro and i'll be happy to show you what i've learned start with my free three-week flash fiction class at hollyswritingclasses.com